children, good morning, wherever you are, and whatever time, the time of the day is in your area. My name is Yemi Omubuiga. Welcome you to today's Family Devotional. God bless you. Thank you for staying with us. Please remember to share these messages. Let us do the work of evangelism together. God bless you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We adore you. We honor your holy name. We bless your holy name, Lord. Thank you for your kindness to us. Thank you, Lord, for all the works of your hands. Thank you, Lord, for the cares you are taking, even of the minutest work of your creation. Father, we, accept, we bless your holy name, particularly for we human beings, how you nurture us. You pattern us after your likeness, after your own image, and you made us the head to everything. The governor, the president, the priest, the everything. You made us hell, head of everything you created. Thank you for this big position you gave to us. And thank you because you are the one enabling us to perform even the assignments you've given to us. Accept our thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. This morning, Lord, we come before you. Please have mercy upon us concerning our iniquities. In the mighty name of Jesus, Amen. Father, we pray the grace to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, preferring it above worldly wealth, worldly prosperity, worldly experiences. That grace, please grant unto us in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Brethren, we want to... Thank God for our lives again. Um, let's listen to what the Bible says in the book of Romans. We are taking a Bible passage or text from Romans 7, 1 to 4, and then we'll continue from verse 14 till where we are comfortable. God bless you as you listen. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man, as long as he lives. For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though the, she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, mm. that you may be married to another, mm. to him who was raised from the dead. Please go to 14. Yes. 14. Verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will, I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer. I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the Good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, I it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that is evil present with me, 
the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in any in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into cap captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. God bless you. Okay. Um, we want to thank God for the little sister. Just press the end button. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We just want to. Oh so Lord. we give glory to God for that. Means, sorry for the disruptions. I mean, <laughs> wherever you tilt, there are challenges. Um, the passage read to us. We're going to from the passage read to us. We're going to examine the topic that says why do we still pray the prayers of forgiveness all the time why is the prayer of forgiveness necessary all the time we thank God because the Bible makes everything clear to us. I treasure all the books in the Bible, but when you talk of Hebrews, Romans in particular, they are books that give practical explanations to what Christianity is. Practical, in practical terms, is not uh, just the principles, excuse me, it's not about the prophecies, it's not even about the history. It's about how to live our day-to-day, -day, you know, life so that we will be able to examine whether we are conforming with what Christ expects from us. The earlier part of that passage did tell us Again, making it clearer what Hebrews has been teaching us, enlightening us about the difference between the law and the spirit or the grace. Because the law, the spirit, the and the grace there is associated with Christ being the surety of the new commandment. Of course, the law, the letter that kills is associated with the laws, that is the commandment, the, the Old Testament laws that we said are 613 in number. And now this new passage, I mean this Romans 7 that we already earlier part, verse 1 to 4, make a distinction between the law and the spirit or the grace or the time or the dispensation of Jesus Christ or telling us, making clear 2 Corinthians 3, 6, which says we are the ministers of the new uh, covenant. Please, if you haven't listened to the messages before this, before today, I mean, there were two messages passed. We've addressed something about the law. And then the Bible lesson that our lesson two in particular dwells so much about the the dissimilarities, dissimilarities between the two um, com, uh, covenants, the old and the new. Now, Paul tries to explain it here more clearly that, look, the meaning of the law is this. The law kinds of brings about um, fixation. Fixation. Let me give the example that he gave. He talked about everything in the world has a law that governs it. He gave marriage as an example. Marriage is the hand of God is when you get married, you are married for life. 
until one of you is dead. You are, you are bound together. You are bonded together. And you cannot on your own unless you have, you know, set the spirit of the Lord that guides marital institutions aside or you are deliberately willing or unwilling to follow God's uh, precepts. You cannot separate yourself from marriage. It's as terrible. And let me give you another example. Like Nigeria now, we are talking of secession, secession. Nigeria is into, I mean, the three tribes, major, all the tribes in Nigeria, don't let me just, because there are more than 250 uh, languages being spoken in Nigeria. So different tribes, but we say three major tribes and then you have the minorities. Now, we are all together, bonded together by the law. They say, Lord, look at came, made us one Nigeria and a law decreed it that, I mean, we are one Nigeria. Then the subsequent constitutions that had been drawn since the beginning of Nigeria up to this 1999 constitution, they are all the laws that bound us together because in the opening paragraphs of the constitution, Nigerian constitution, it says, we, the people of Nigeria, whether the constitution was money, I mean, fraudulently arrived at or whatever, but we are, we are all signatories to it. So now we are seeing injustice and we are now saying, okay, we, are, we were bound together before, but there is injustice, let us separate. We now find it that the law that brought us together does not allow. If not, we would have just sat together and said, let everybody go his own way. And then things would have been, it is the law that is working against us now. That is why, if it, you know, there are two things. You want to use the, if you must circumvent the law, if you must change the law, you will still apply the law itself to create another law that will say Nigeria ceases to exist and then everybody goes his own way. Then that way we can separate, everybody can go. But is it easy? No, just as it is in the marriage in between husband and wife. So it is in this relationship that we are in called Nigeria. It's not easy to separate. If you want to use violence, just as you see people doing, going to divorce or killing one another, I mean, it's just a replica of real life marriage. You want to, you see that husbands are killing wives now because the marriage is not working. Wives are killing husbands, even side chicks that are not even going to legal relationship are killing themselves because there is a relationship that, you know, in between them. Now, if you must separate now, for instance, there is, I mean, you must separate. You have to follow certain rules, just as you would do in the normal marriage. The normal marriage will sell you. We can't divorce you until the relationship has become irreconcilable. Irreconcilable. It's broken down beyond what can be reconciled. That's why you have a period of separation. And divorce is a necessity when, you know, it is obvious that either party can kill or destroy another. May that not be our portion. That's how difficult it is to marry. But the moment an husband dies or a wife dies, the, the remaining person is free to go and marry, remarry. He has not committed adultery. He has not broken any law because he's freed from the bondage of the law. However, in terms of the spirit, it is different. In the sense that a spiritual person is not under the law because when you are under the spirit, the spirit makes you to do things that are righteous. Righteousness is the opposite of sinfulness. Sin, at the, I mean, when you commit sin, the law comes in and punishes you. But when you are under the spirit, you don't even commit 
chapter 3 at all. Now, look at the practical side in the life of Paul, which is the same thing in our lives today. In my own life that I'm speaking, in your life that you are listening. How many times have you lived completely righteous? How many times? No wonder. Romans 3.23 makes it clear. Makes it clear that the, I mean, for all have sinned. All of us, you, me, everybody. It doesn't matter that I'm preaching. I still, I still breach the law. I still make mistakes. I still commit sins. I mean, consciously or unconsciously. And if Jesus can say, for instance, let's take the law of adultery or fornication, put it into context that a man who looks, not when you do it with your body, who looks intently, lustfully at a woman, he says you have committed it. With this one, what is happening in churches today, you will see that a lot of pastors, ministers of God, look at women lustfully. That's the truth. Just like the President Jimmy Carter, ex-President Jimmy Carter will say, to God be the glory that um, I'm, I'm a, I think it's a method by, by, by religion, and he said, ah, thank God, if I were to be judged by what I do, <laughs> I would not qualify for heaven. But thank God that Christ has come in to save us from the wrath of the law. Because once you look intently at a man, even though it cannot be easily proved, so it means that even if a third party can see the two of you together and see the way you look at that man conclude within him or herself that you looked at that woman lustfully. The law ought to catch us up and begin to punish us even though you have not physically committed adultery or fornication. So you can now see. But now Paul says, in reality, this is where I'm coming. Into. In reality, we are all sinners. No matter how much you think you are righteous or holy. That's why the Bible says your righteousness is like a filthy rag before God. Because no matter how things are too many, and you break, you you commit some unconsciously, and you commit some consciously. Now that is why to come to the question that we raised earlier: Why do we still continue to pray that God should have mercy upon us? Why is it that uh, as if we say we are under the grace, then we why I mean if we do anything now we don't even need to bother. All we should do is just allow life to move on. That's not so in practicality. If you look at verse 19, look at what Paul says here. For the good which I would like to do, I do not do. But the evil which I would not do. That I practice. Take note. I want to do good. But I find it difficult to do it. But evil. Let me give an example. For me to. I told you the other time. God help men in particular. In matters of women. If the spirit of God. Does not. Predominate your heart. You will discover that. You want to win the opposite sex. For Christ. But when you get there, two spirits will minister to you. Maybe the lady, you adjust her to be very pretty. And then you go there. The first thing that will be, ah, well, you remember the intention you carried there is to preach to her. But when you get there and then, because of the look, because of everything, you get fascinated and get swayed away from your original intention, which can even manifest in something else later. You understand what I mean? Initially, okay, because you come to preach, you can preach and preach and preach. Then when the lady now comes into your church and then over time, you have been admiring her. You already committed lustful, you know, you look lustfully at her. Already you committed adultery if you are married, fornication if you are, if you are not married and so on and so forth. Now, 
gradually. Maybe this girl eventually has something that brings her to you closer, intimately, and something. Then through your counseling and so on and so forth, something else enters. You have brought her to Christ, but again, you have brought her to yourself. And all these things are happening in the church of God, even in the church of God. We all know that we ought to win this our opposite sex for Christ. But look at what manifests. That's why Bible says, let him who stands, you know, beware. Because you need to really be able to man. You see, Christianity is about also about discipline, which is difficult for man to do. A man has a wife in the house, he still wants to continue to only carry on. He wants to even marry legally several wives. And when the troubles come, then he faces the challenge. So Paul says, the good things I ought to do, I find difficult to do. But the bad things which I don't intend, I do them easily. We all fall into that category. Practically in our Christian life, every day we are faced with temptation. It might be temptation to steal, it might be temptation for sexual immorality, it might be temptation to lie, it might be temptation to do any form of evil. But as I always say, if you bring people together, you say, let us pray. You see that everybody's spirit is down. That's a good thing that we tend, that we are supposed to do. It is then, let us do Bible study. It is then you say, I'm busy, and headache, and leg ache, and hand ache. You begin to give one. And then even when you are doing it, you are doing it half-heartedly. There are somebody has to be prompting you. Read now. And listen now. Okay, what did you learn from the whole thing that we've been talking about this morning? Nothing. Let us share the grace and just go. Because if your heart and mind, if they are with you while the study is going, on, there's no way you won't have a question to ask, especially during Bible studies. We know that sermons don't allow for questions and answers. That's why if you really want to understand the in-depth of the Bible, it is through Bible studies. Now, that is it. So as a result of this, because we are incapable of you know, maintaining that discipline you know, steadily, we fall by the wayside many a time. And then that's why even unconsciously we do so. If you are even talking of the one that is conscious, you can see you can check it. But the ones that you do unconsciously, you don't even know that you've committed a sin. So you can now see everybody struggles with this. That is why every day, every time, we should be asking for God's mercy. And that's why, like I said, there's no matter how righteous you think you are, that you don't flout um, the laws of God. And then that the only way out is now you ask for forgiveness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who has been, who has already paid the price for your sins and my sin. So that is why we, when you ask it, also, you see, when you are praying, you have about three major categories. Thanksgiving, praise and worship. Thanksgiving. Then forgiveness of sins. Okay, there are four of them. Then make your requests in that order. If you, first of all, acknowledge God, worship him, praise him, and then, then you come to, you know, uh, asking for forgiveness. Because up to the time you are doing, there are some things that are, there are accumulated sins that you have committed consciously or unconsciously. And then when you pray now in Jesus' name for forgiveness, and you too, empty yourself, empty your heart from the people that have offended you. And those you also remember those you offend, that God should give them the spirit to forgive you. So you can see. Because if we are able to live a disciplined life, then we will be boastful that, A, we can even be sure that oh, we are making heaven by our own works. That's why our works. Our prayers are everything. They don't just save us. It is the mercy, the grace, which we get through the names of the name of Jesus Christ. When you have acknowledged Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, then when you pray through him, all those things are erased. I hope we've made a point. Please remember from today, you cannot be 100% holy and righteous. Even if you think you are, it is like a filthy rag before God. So it doesn't save you, but when you confess your sins and you ask for forgiveness, you are forgiven. So 
You can see Paul says, well, I know that the spirit of evil and good dwell in me. I fall into the evil ones several times, but I know that the good spirit in me, which is of Christ, overtakes that. So with that, I am saved. That should be our stand. God help bless you. Um, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you again for these clarifications, important clarifications you are making concerning our relationship with you. Be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. King of kings, Lord of lords, we pray that as we pray to you for forgiveness of our sins all the time, please forgive us in the mighty name of Jesus. In advance, Peter prayed for Jesus. Uh, please, Jesus prayed for Peter. In advance of the sins, he will, Peter will commit. And when the time came, Peter committed those sins and he was forgiven. Jesus said, I have prayed for you in advance. Please, Daddy, pray for us in advance, even of the sins that we may commit or will commit in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you. Thank Blessed be to your name. In Jesus' name, we pray. Mm -hmm. Now, brethren, apart from listening to these messages, I know you know you have your own personal uh, devotional, you know, study the Bible. This is just a guide for you to know, you know, at least you are reminded that your spirit is quickened towards God. Then, number two, if you have not been fellowshipping with any church, please, there are churches near you. Even if, I mean, we are talking of Bible-believing church, how do you even identify identify with any church that you perceive is so good for you there? But study the Bible yourself so that whatever you are taught, like the man who was coming from, is it Philip now, who was coming from, the gentleman who was coming riding on his horse when coming from the crusade, from the crusade in Ethiopia, also is there in the Bible. And Philip's asked him, do you understand? He said, how will I understand unless somebody explains to me? So you yourself, go into the study of the word of God. Then you can be fully liberated. But above all, never live a life without Christ. Because you can't face the temptations of the world alone. And if for any reason you fall, it's Christ that can also deliver you. Please take note of these things. God bless you. Have a wonderful day.